In this lecture, we're going to be looking at the changing status of children and of childhood in general. And the key debate here is whether or not childhood is improving or whether it's not improving. And in fact, it's getting worse. So we've, again, we'll be referring back to the March of Progress view, who's, who was suggesting that childhood is improving and it's better than it ever was. But the conflict view and the child liberation thesis suggests that actually childhood is, is not as good as we think it is and that perhaps we need to rethink some of the protections that we are putting in place for children. So we're going to start off by looking at the March of Progress view and in this view they're suggesting that over the past few centuries the position of children in Western society has steadily been improving and today it is better than it's ever been and You've got de Maus in 1974 who kind of sums this up by saying that the further back in history you go, the lower the level of childcare and children were more likely to be killed, abandoned, terrorised, beaten and sexually abused. And this could be linked to social attitudes towards children and particularly where you had high infant mortality rates, children were not really kind of bonded to until they were a little bit older just in case there was infant mortality and children died early in um, their lives and also children would be expected to go out and work and provide income to the family which could be an apprenticeship it could be within the family business it could be as household servants particularly within the working class um, where they would possibly be um, beaten and terrorised and possibly sexually abused because they were seen as property. An apprentice belonged to the master until they had completed their apprenticeship and they were ready to go off out into the world and do their own um, thing and do their own and run their own business. Household staff were paid slavery to, a, to an extent in that they, they belonged to the family. And if one family member died, then they, the, the, the household staff would be inherited by the next generation. But the March of Progress view really suggests that today in modern society, childhood is a protected time. It is a precious time and that it is better than it's ever been before. And they identify four pieces of evidence to um, explain how childhood has improved. The first they point to is legal improvements. Children are now in school until they're 18 and therefore unable to work. And if they do get part time jobs, they're restricted on the number of hours they can work and the, which hours in the day they are allowed to work. Um, we have greater safeguarding in schools, and this has improved even in the 15, 20 years that I've been teaching. Um, when I first started teaching, we didn't get safeguarding training, and now it's an, an annual part of our teacher training to be able to um, identify the possibilities of any form of safeguarding issue, whether that be abuse, neglect, um, radicalization all of these things as a teacher we are trained to kind of go um, something's not quite right here and and to report it um, in order to add that extra level of protection on on children and you've also got the separation of the juvenile and adult um, legal systems so in the UK, you are legally responsible for your actions from the age of 10. However, you will be treated differently if you are a 10 year old murderer to if you were a 30 year old murderer. Um, and usually around the ages of about 14, 15, they would, there's a little bit of a grey area where the prosecution can decide whether they're going to try you as an adult or as a child. But the law in the UK states that if you are convicted as a child, you cannot be held as an adult. So you are released at 18 and your record is sealed. 
Um, if you're tried as an adult, you might spend the first few years of your sentence in a juvenile detention centre and at the age of 19, 20, be moved to an adult prison. But you would have been tried as an adult, not as a juvenile. But these protections, legal protections, are put in place to ensure that childhood stays a protected, precious time. We've also got the introduction of the United Nations Rights of the Child, and this was introduced. This was signed in 1990 and became enforceable in nine, sorry, signed in 1989 and enforceable in 1990, and was signed by 140 countries around the world. Obviously, not all of them. And the rights of the child state that every child has the basic fundamental rights. These include life, survival, development, protection from violence, abuse and neglect, an education that allows children to fulfil their potential, be raised by or have a relationship with their parents, to express their opinions and be listened to. There are 54 conventions to the United Nations Rights of the Child and these, in most cases, have been um, employed into national law. The Convention on its own is not legal. It requires individual countries to turn it into law. In the UK, we have the, United, we have the um, Children's Act in 1989, which encompasses a majority of the um, conventions, but also brings together a lot of the other laws which were around at the time to kind of have one place for the protections for children. Um, the Convention on the Rights of the Child also states that um, under 18s are not forcibly recruited into the armed forces, prohibition of child pornography, prostitution and slavery, and allows children whose rights have been violated to complain directly to the UN. So if you believe your rights have been violated in some way, you have the right to complain directly to the United Nations. How far that will go or how that process works, I have no idea. Um, but under UK law, until you are 18, your parents are the people who are the protectors of your rights. Teachers are the protectors of your rights. Um, so not, as I said, not all countries have signed up to this, but it shows how, as a global nation, in a global sense, we are turning away from, uh, we are creating a more protected and um, more precious element that is childhood. With both of those, it's led to more protections and welfare services. In the UK, we have a Minister for Children Children and Family Social Services. Um, we have social services whose purpose is to protect children and support families within the conventions of the um, Rights of the Child as well as the 1989 Child Protection Act, sorry, Children's Act. Um, but there are lots of services now, both government, non-governmental and charities, whose sole purpose is to protect children, support children and um, help them when situations become out of their control. And finally, you have um, the growth of child centeredness. Now, this isn't the case of the belief that children suddenly decide everything. It's a, the idea that in, within a family, children are central to the decision making process. So when deciding where to go on holiday, whether to move house, changes in job, Things like that is like, well, what's going to be best for my child? What's going to give them the best opportunities? What's going to be um, best for them? It might not be as simple as kind of deciding what to have to dinner. In some families, that, that, that is a situation where the children will have a different meal to parents. And in some cases, that's necessary, particularly if you've got children who have issues with eating or maybe um, some form of um, autistic spectrum disorder. Um, for example, my um, middle niece um, doesn't like meat. She never has, never eats it. She finds the texture uh, disgusting in her mouth. Um, she's not a moral vegetarian. She is a I don't like meat vegetarian. So that obviously means that she has slightly different meals 
to the rest of her family who are meat eaters. Um, a lot of autistic spectrum disorder children will only eat certain things because of texture or taste or colour. Um, so it, it, in those situations, yes, they may have different meals to their parents, but that would be because they're doing what's best for the child. They're not forcing them to eat things that they don't want to eat. Um, so the, the March of Progress view very much suggests that these protections, these changes, these improvements in law and services have meant that childhood is now much better than it's ever been. Childhood is more protected. It's a precious state or, or a period of time in a person's life where they're vulnerable and therefore need looking after. However, it is argued that the improvements haven't necessarily made childhood better. But what they've resulted in is helicopter parenting and child, children with a lack of resilience. Now, the term helicopter parenting refers to the parents who kind of hover around their children at all times, removing any obstacle, any problem that's in their way. So perhaps the children don't learn problem solving skills or um, conflict management or how to pick problem solve and pick themselves up after a failure. They're the sort of parents who, if a child doesn't do well in a test, will ring up the school and kind of go, well, what did you do wrong? To the, to the teacher or if there's a problem with a friendship group every other child is the problem not theirs um, and it's argued that because of all the protections and this notion of childhood being precious that um, we, we've removed any form of obstacle or any form of problem from a child's life meaning that they don't necessarily know how to problem solve how to be resilient and things like that so at the other end of the spectrum we've got the conflict view and they argue that the march of progress's view that childhood is better than it's ever been that children are more protected and precious than they've ever been before is false because in society we have conflict and we have inequality and they argue that there are two forms of conflict within um, society and that children will experience this conflict and have different experiences of childhood and for some it will be better than others. So we've got what's referred to as intra-child conflict and inequality where um, children will experience um, childhood differently based on gender, ethnicity and class as well as adult child conflict um, which is put forward by the child liberationists. So we're going to deal with the inequality between children first and this idea that not all children will experience the rose tinted view of childhood that the March of Progress put forward. So first of all we've got Maya Hillman who talks about differences in childhood experiences based on gender and he argues that um, Due to gender role socialisation, boys are given more freedom at an earlier age than girls, who are often socialised into the bedroom culture, meaning that they lead a more sedate, passive, quiet um, childhood compared to boys who are rough and tumble, out having adventures, running around in the woods kind of thing. And Mayor Hillman argues that this can mean that boys have a better or more um, beneficial childhood experience because they have the chance to get out there and have their own adventures and climb trees and things like that whereas girls are mollycoddled and wrapped in cotton wool and treated like fragile glass which might improve their educational um, opportunities because they tend to join start school with higher cognitive development and um, literacy skills but do they have that wild wonderful experience of, of going into adventures as children and Maya Hillman suggests that's not the case. Julia Brennan talks about differences in um, ethnicity and states that ethnic groups will have different ethnic different expectations on their children and what age they should take responsibilities. So in some ethnic groups, children will take on responsibilities much earlier 
than in other ethnic groups, which could limit their childhood experiences. Um, for example, she talks about Asian families who are much stricter and, and held tighter control on their daughters, whereas Bahati in 99 found that the idea of izat or family honour can also have an impact on children's experiences. If you're brought up be, being told the, of you've got to maintain the family honour, it may limit your experiences or it may extend your experiences. So it could happen either way. But they argue that the, these expectations on children vary depending on the ethnicity they're brought up and culture in which they're brought up in. And this links in with social class. And this comes from Woodroffe, who um, argues that uh, working class and underclass women are more likely to give birth to children of lower weight and prematurely, which can link to both development, physical and mental development with children who are premature often um, taking longer to, to um, catch up with their non-premature um, counterparts and possibly having um, some learning difficulties. Um, for example, I, my niece was, uh, my eldest niece was born three months premature um, due to preeclampsia and she um, has gone through her education with dyslexia, dyspraxia and low working memory which is linked to her prematurity. Um, so it could be argued that children from working class or poorer families have a... what's the word I'm looking for? Um, their childhood isn't as enriched due to these possible developmental difficulties. It's also argued, Woodroff also argues that children from poor families are more likely to die in infancy or suffer long-term illnesses. Um, and they're more likely to be put on child protection lists for neglect. Now, what we can also argue is that um, it's not just the working class families that can lead to negative childhood experiences. Um, middle class families, there's been a recent study and I can't remember who did it, but middle class families tend to over schedule their children. They, they go to school during the day, they come home, they've got clubs, they've got le additional lessons, they've got tutoring, um, they belong to various sports groups as well. So their life is very scheduled, which means they don't get a lot of downtime to do the exploration play and just hang out with friends and things like that, which again can have a negative impact on um, childhood. But middle class children do also tend to have a longer childhood with more protections from their parents because they're financially able to do it. Working class children might get part time jobs at a much earlier age in order to support the family. So depending on your gender, your ethnicity or your class, your experience of childhood may be fantastic, as the March Progress view suggests, but it may also be much harder and not much different to what, um, what has previously been around. If we look then, move then towards looking at the inequality between child and adult, children and adult, and this comes from the child liberationist view. And the child liberationists believe that childhood has become oppressive, with adults using the excuse of protection to limit and tightly control children's activities. Now, Firestone and Holt see what March Progress see as care and protection as just new forms of oppression and control. And they believe that children need to be free from adult control. Now, um, Diane Kittings refers to um, this as um, age patriarchy, where the older generations oppress and dominate children um, not allowing them the freedom to see, to, to experience childhood. 
And they believe that child children are controlled by adults in four main ways. The first is time. Children have rather strict daily routines, especially when they started school. Um, but even in holidays, children will control when um, children, parents will control when children eat, when they sleep, when they can watch telly, where, what, um, where they, when they're allowed outside, when they've got to be indoors, how much time they can use to be on the computer and things like that. And parents also try to control how quickly their children grow up by sometimes limiting their levels of responsibility or behaviour. Now, it's something that I've noticed particularly um, culturally between the US and the UK and the way that 18 year olds are treated in the US compared to the UK. In the UK, at 18, you're an adult. You make your decisions, you, can, you move out of home, you go to university or not, you get a job. But in the US, you're still very much considered a child. And where you go to university has a um, very strong link to your parents because generally they're paying for it. Um, people at 18 will still have a curfew when at the time they've got to be home and things like that. So it, it's in one respect, it's about protection, but in other respects, from the child liberationist view, it's actually restrictive and oppressive. The next one is about space and the idea of children's movements, particularly in Western society, is very heavily regulated. Um, there will be, for example, specific areas where they're allowed to play and when they're not, where they're allowed to go, shops that may restrict the number of children they allow into the shop during the day. Um, there's higher levels of CCTV coverage in children's play areas and places like that. And I mean, from my experience as a child, it was a case of Saturday morning, eat your breakfast, here's a fiver, off you go, come back when it's dark. My parents, we didn't have mobile phones or anything like that. My parents didn't know where I was or what I was doing. And they only worried if I didn't come back by curfew. However, these days, um, it's a case of parents having GPS trackers on their children's mobile phones so they know where they are at all times. Um, there are more restrictions on where children are allowed to go, where they're not allowed to go in terms of you can go as far as this point, but you're not allowed to go as far as that point. You're not allowed to cross this main road, but you can cross this road. So there's a lot more restrictions on where children can go and where they're not allowed to go. Resources. In industrial societies, that um, we have limited children's access to earning money. You're not allowed to have a job. And if you do have a job, you're very limited in how many hours you can work, when you're allowed to work and things like that. So children remain dependent upon adults for resources, for food, for toys, for clothing, for all of these things. Um, you are required to ask your parents permission. Now, it might be you get an allowance and that's your money and you can do whatever you want with it. But it's your parents giving you that allowance. Um, I know uh, quite recently there's been a trend in parents getting children um, like a debit card type thing that they top up each month or each week with their allowance and that's their their money and they manage their money accordingly. But that money is still coming from their parents. And if their parents decide to change the amount, maybe lower it, maybe higher it, or to stop it entirely, that's up to them. And that can restrict children in terms of what they can and cannot do. And the final one is about children's bodies. Adults exercise great control over children's bodies, including how they sit, how they walk, how they dress, dress even, um, how they're touched, and they control how children touch their own bodies. Things like not picking your nose, not scratching your genitals in public, um, not sticking your hands down your pants, things like that are always told, no, 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 you don't do that, don't do that. Um, but even, particularly until you're maybe pre to a certain age where your parents are buying your clothes for you and you may not have any um, control or any decision making in that, with um, how you sit, how you walk, how you um, live your life, your 
even to a certain extent your weight can be controlled by your parents because they're the ones who are providing the food for you. So for the child liberationists, they see this as a negative on childhood in the fact that it's not better than it's ever been. It's a smokescreen. This protection and preciousness of childhood is just a smokescreen for more oppression and more um, control of children. There's also the argument about child abuse and neglect. Um, the definition of abuse is more than just physical abuse. It can be psychological, neglect, emotional abuse and sexual abuse. And it's not just adult on child, but can also be between siblings. And the child liberationists and the conflict view argue that there has been a huge increase in reports of child abuse and neglect. The NSPCC in 2011 found that one in five children had been severely mal maltreated during their childhood by a parent or guardian. In 2013, the DfE reported that there were nearly 43,000 children subjected to child protection orders. Um, and these statistics are still limited because they're the reported there's probably a lot more there that's not reported. Quite recently, there have been um, a lot in the news about sexual abuse in schools and um, the levels of sexual abuse in schools. So the conflict view would argue that childhood's not better than it's ever been. It's actually worse. There's more abuse. There's more um, neglect of children. However, it could also be argued that these increases are evidence of greater protection of children because more people are speaking out. Now, as I said before, when I first started teaching, child protection wasn't really a thing. It wasn't something that was a, a requirement of um, teachers. Um, we did it, but it wasn't le a legal requirement, whereas now we are anything that we're worried about, we are legally obligated to report just in case. And it's better, we're told, it's better to report it and it be nothing than not report it and it be something. So we could argue that in fact, the changes in society where we are now speaking out about sexual abuse, we're speaking out about sexual harassment, neglect, psychological abuse, domestic violence has led to this increase. And that's not necessarily saying that there's been a change in the amounts of abuse, it's just more people are reporting it. So whether or not the changing state of childhood is a positive or a negative is up to you, but there is evidence both ways to suggest that childhood is getting better than it's ever been before. There's more protection, there's more support, there's more caring of children, but also the flip side of that is that childhood perhaps is becoming more oppressive and there is more control over children and not allowing them to experience childhood fully.